at how we respond yeah. so that we actually improve the number of uh, victims who do support a prosecution or yeah. feel they're able to support prosecution. So, um, yeah, we spent, a, we spent a good chunk of time on that. So I think. Great. Great. Thank you. Any questions about the dashboard? Just one, really. A uh, total number of ASD incidents have significantly decreased. I just think that's one really to raise as a really good area, particularly in terms of the community, as to you know what what's actually driven that that sort of a positive decrease. I think uh, just a caveat on that, we did put a huge amount into reduction of antisocial behaviour, particularly tackling the things that cause antisocial behaviour to bring about a reduction. We are also crowning more of that, so so the the kind of current standards. Um, an element of that reduction will be because stuff is going into crime, which, mm. which is, you know, we can argue rights and wrongs of that. The important thing is they are recorded either way. And when we're um, doing our, our antisocial behaviour planning and our antisocial behaviour governance, we take into account both the recorded crime element and the reports of antisocial behaviour, so we're not missing anything when we're targeting our patrol activity and our problem solving behaviour. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so as I say, that will be a baseline that we'll come back to in future meetings as well to monitor how we progress throughout the year. Any um, issues? Um, so next one then we're moving on to is, um, uh, again, a new section I've added to the agenda around emerging issues. Um, although the, um, the focus of today's meeting wasn't specifically around the work in terms of serious violence, obviously we couldn't really have this meeting without reflecting on, on what's happened um, a few weeks ago in terms of the three firearms murders and also um, uh, the number of knife um, incidents as well. So I suppose um, it was really just to have a discussion into the work that's been done around that. Um, anything more you want to add to what's already kind of out there and some of the outcomes of what you're seeing through the investigations? So it's split into three, okay. Commissioner, and you're absolutely right, it's right to have the discussion now given the, the um, well five homicides, we've had two domestic abuse homicides yeah. the last few weeks, but three firearms and able homicides the first in 13 months. Um, around it and for the, for the families of um, Sam, Ashley and Olivia, uh, Chris will outline um, some of the work and you'll be conscious of the time here and I suppose the purpose of this meeting that will keep our brief in terms of uh, the public nature of this meeting but the yeah. very huge progress that has been made um, by uh, the investigation teams in relation to, uh, to that. Chris will also just outline as the top lead work that we are now doing uh, to build on where we are. Yeah. Uh, having had a recent outstanding grade in front of HMIC FRS, having had two years where we've had in the last 20 years the lowest numbers of firearms discharges, recognising the incomprehensible nature of the mur all the murders, particularly of a nine-year-old in, in her own home, one that we should reflect on in terms of our, uh, of our approach and build on our approach both to prevent as much yeah. harm to our communities, which we believe will make great progress, which we've reflected in that grading um, as well as pursuing uh, those who cause most harm. But Paul just outlined our approach to Operation Miller and some of the successes and the review that we've got in relation to that and then John in relation to the successes that we've had but also the approach that we seek to take around that clear hole build where we seek to go in, remove organised criminality but work with communities to make sure they are as safe places as, uh, as, uh, as, as possible as well. So uh, we'll do that obviously. Uh, yeah. take, take comments to yourself in the time that we've got. Yeah, yeah. We, will, we will bridge it down and take any points that you want to uh, specifically raise. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I'm sure I'll start with uh, the fact that our thoughts and prayers remain with the families of, of yeah. Sam, Ashley, and Olivia. Um, all three families have, uh, have recently gone through funerals where they've, uh, they've, they've buried their loved ones. Uh, they continue to be supported by specially trained family liaison officers and. Uh, I know a number of us have uh, had a personal uh, interaction and, uh, and contact with those uh, those officers who, um, you know, have done a fantastic job in supporting uh, the three families. So uh, clearly, you are party to um, uh, and at your office the, uh, the multi-agency goal meeting structure mm -hmm. that we put in place immediately as a result of uh, these three tragedies. Um, and the stakeholder briefings that uh, have continued uh, across the, the wider partnership. Um, and I would make the point that uh, you know, our, both our statutory and our non-statutory partners uh, who uh, contributed to our overall response to these incidents have been fantastic in coming together, uh, working together across Merseyside, which was, was great to see um, in my position as the, as the goal commander. Um, 
The ongoing investigations remain in relation to all three of those investigations. Uh, and in fact, uh, as we sit here now, there is a, a press conference, a further press conference taking place at headquarters that uh, Mark Kameen is, uh, is hosting with Crime Stoppers, uh, where a, uh, a significant reward will be offered for information specifically leading to the identification and the conviction of, the, uh, of those responsible for the death of Olivia. Mm -hmm. um, so we have been supported by mutual aid and resources uh, both regionally and nationally and specialist assets from uh, amongst other agencies, the National Crime Agency. Um, we have made arrests on all three of those uh, investigations. They remain live and ongoing investigations. Mm -hmm. And the teams uh, that are, are set at the moment, led by experienced senior investigating officers across all three, um, are working now to piece together and build the evidential picture of exactly what happened. Um, clearly, uh, these were not random incidents that, that happened. Um, so people uh, make plans and offenders make plans in terms of how they're going to do things and the, the, the manner in which they, uh, they, they undertake those crimes. So our job is to make sure that we piece together all of the detailed evidence so that we can identify those responsible and bring to justice and remain unstinting in, in, in that aim. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly I am aware through the, the detailed briefings that I have on a daily basis in relation to all three of those investigations. Uh, that they are progressing extremely positively and, uh, and we are heading towards that, that point of um, where we will be able to identify and bring offences to justice. So I won't go into specific details no, around the, uh, the three investigations given the, uh, the, the forum that we were in uh, and I'll pause there and questions. No, I suppose just to note that, you know, feedback I think from the officers and the staff who've been involved has been incredibly positive in terms of their response to that. And, you know, I was really impressed in the last um, couple of weeks just how well people have stepped up partners as well um, to respond to it, which is um, really positive. So I welcome that. Um, in terms of then what, what are we doing about it so from the SOC point of view? You know, I, you know, are we doing enough to stop these firearms getting to the streets, to identify who these people are and trying to prevent them from happening? So I think um, yeah, there's a number of points to that, that question that the Deputy has, has outlined uh, our position across Merseyside in terms of the lowest number of discharges over yeah. 20 years. But we, we have all consistently said that one discharge is yeah. one discharge too many. Uh, so we need to continue and we, you know, uh, we will, as our um, strategy talks about, be relentless in that pursuit of those involved in Northern Ireland and bringing firearms onto the street. A note to make, perhaps, is that uh, Mark Hameen, who uh, you, you will uh, be aware is the, the pit for, so he sits above the senior investigating officer as that bridge between chief officers and the senior investigating uh, team uh, for Olivia's murder. He actually leads regionally for us in relation to uh, our firearms threat. Um, and certainly over the last three years, I mean, in my position previously in the region, I've seen the, uh, the development of that strategic group, that mm. strategic governance group around firearms. Um, and there is a really strong, cohesion, four piece plan to um, effectively deal with all aspects of firearms possession, supply, um, movement, storage, use, etc., uh, across the Northwest. And that's why we have seen some significant reductions in the number of discharges and, and in the intelligence that suggests the availability of firearms. Uh, that said, clearly events most recently have demonstrated that actually there are firearms in circulation. They come from a variety of different uh, avenues and, and sources and they do manifest themselves on the streets of big cities, mm -hmm. you know, London, Birmingham, Liverpool, uh, Manchester and most, most four of them. Um, so uh, one task that I've, I've taken from the, uh, the Chief is to actually uh, pause now and reflect on our SOC strategy in full. Um, absolutely right that we since 2014 have been graded outstanding by the Majesty's Inspectors and uh, having spoken to... His Majesty's <laughs> His Majesty, sorry. Um, and, uh, the, from, from feedback that I've had most recently, in terms of some of our staff who are our senior staff who are asked to go and assist His Majesty's inspectors, go and inspect other forces, mm -hmm. and the feedback we get in terms of the work that we are doing across that national HMG um, uh, for all strategy, 
and um, you know it's it's no um, it's no mistake as to why we are great as ours. I think because of some of the work that, that we that we lead on nationally. Um, now that said, the piece of work that the chief has given me is to like, pause now and review and revise. Um, are we doing everything, absolutely everything that we uh, should be doing and need to be doing? What needs to be accelerated? What needs to be strengthened? What needs to be brought together into uh, any sort of provision of cohesion plan? Because clearly what happened across the, our streets over the last month uh, is not acceptable and we need to respond uh, mm -hmm. accordingly. So that's a piece of work. It's a tight time scale of a, uh, of a month to pull that together. We know that we've got a variety of lines of work ongoing uh, in terms of funding streams coming into the force, as well as where um, all of our strategic threats from organised crime manifest themselves across Merseyside. So firearms is there, there's one chunk of it, but only, only one chunk of, of ultimately the 15 strategic yeah. threats across the, the North West. So that review work is ongoing uh, with a number of uh, people across the force and the wider partnership because this isn't just a single uh, agency or single organisation issue because uh, mm -hmm. we work uh, collaboratively with many partners. Um, and I will then present back to, to Chief Officers in terms of the uh, recommendations from that uh, piece of review work. I think it's, if I just come, just come in there, you know, um, John, will come, John will come on to the, um, the partnership work that we were already doing. Um, you know, Chris has outlined there, we're an outstanding, an outstanding force for serious and organised crime. We are recognised nationally in the approach we, we take in relation to criminal use of firearms. So forces actually come to, have come to see us and adopted many of our processes that we have introduced, which mean that we do have the lowest number of firearms discharges that we've had for 21 years. You know, we haven't had a firearms enabled murder for, for 12 months. We have got a strong four keys plan. We, we are doing well in, in relation to our partnership approach to serious violence. Um, but when a nine year old child has been murdered, that's not a time for us to say we're doing enough. Yes. We, which was your question, are we doing enough? Yeah. Well, we've been, you know, we have been doing a lot of work and we are national leaders in relation to the work we're doing. But to our communities, we have to say, when a nine-year-old child's been murdered, that we need to move pause, review everything we're doing and see what else we can do, uh, because it's just not acceptable for three people to be murdered within the space of seven days on the streets of Merseyside. Um, but, you know, we, I'd say we do come from a strong position and national recognition for that. Yeah. <coughs> Paul, are you next, or John? Yeah, I can go next, Commissioner. So, just in relation to Operation Miller, which was put in place, post those three tragic murders to uh, target criminality linked to the individuals involved in the, the, those investigations, either by association, uh, geography, and also to react to community intelligence. So that, that operation commenced on the 23rd of August. Um, that used all uh, assets of the so police, into operational assets in terms of uniformed officers, playing clothes officers, dogs, okay. mounted, both policing, firearms officers, and we deployed probably as many resources in certain geographic areas as we ever have done um, in, in recent years. Um, the results have been have been excellent. Some outstanding. I'll just run through some headlines for you now. Just in terms of arrests, there have been 678 arrests. There's 1,864 1, stop searches and, and we do recognise in terms of volume and stop search but there is still scrutiny around that, you know, that absolute scrutiny around that to maintain the sort of trust and legitimacy piece. And we also had uh, mutual aid officers deployed in that sort of over uh, uniform response. And again, we reiterated that level of scrutiny around their stop searches as well. So we're very conscious of, of that. 963 intelligence submissions, 14 farms recoveries, 148 vehicles seized, 385 roast policing enforcements, and 142 warrants executed, 127 open land searches. So, I think by anyone's estimation, that was a significant effort and, and that continues, it, it is a phased approach. Um, and, and just some reassurance, even in, in the last few days, the, the results from Operation Miller did some sort of narrative around some qualitative feedback. Um, Netherby Street, there was um, intelligence received regarding firearms being stored there. Uh, warrant executed hand grenade, possible scorpion or scorpion machine pistol uh, with eight magazines in excess of 800 out, uh, rounds of ammunition recovered mm -hmm. uh, and people were arrested in relation to that. On the same day, a chemical drugs factory in Harbeth Close uh, looks like a, an Amphet production laboratory. 
And then just a couple of days before that, there was a recovery uh, of a Glock handgun, seven live rounds, uh, as a result of a, an arrest in those so those times of recovery it's, it's just over the border into Lancaster and Skelmersdale. So, you know, that the operation continues. The focus is very much on certain individuals reacting to community intelligence and, and those key areas that have been impacted by those incidents in recent weeks. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, just uh, two things really, sort of one lot I'll talk about Blair Hall Build in a minute, but just sort of some um, reiteration of some of the multi-agency work we're doing through Operation Interface and two facets of it particularly. You're aware we've reported previously on our work around Operation Adder, uh, and Operation GRIP, which is our serious violence um, uh, approach um, within communities. Uh, as the Chief described, we're proud of what we've done, but absolutely we've got to redouble our efforts in this. And uh, that preventative approach, the, um, the approach to keeping communities feeling safe. Um, and we've done that very much with repurposing some of the violence, or potentially repurposing some of the violence structure partnership money to respond to those issues that local authorities particularly have raised as being particularly relevant to the impact of communities, particularly relevant to impacting serious violent crime and preventing young mm. people from being drawn into criminality. Um, on, on one hand, you're clearly aware of that, we reported on that recently, but also under our county lines work, I'm really pleased to report we've got our fifth charge this week for modern slavery offences from the Operation Toxic Team, really difficult to achieve, uh, really key in our approach to safeguarding young people and tackling some of those root causes of exploitation, which lead to some manifestations of serious violence in our communities. Um, in terms of Clearhold Bill particularly, um, this is a, a strategy, that, uh, a multi-agency strategy that we employ in certain um, areas, very geographically focused in high harm, high risk, uh, locations uh, and certainly we've got one such area in the Wirral um, that we're in now which is producing some significant results effectively three phases the clear phase is tackling causes of high harm and high risk in communities so as Chris described earlier the relentless pursuit mm. of serious and organized criminals and uh, taking them out creating the environment where we can move in with the neighborhood teams more effectively and deliver with communities and with partners that preventative approach identifying and developing joint coordinated plans to the issues that more broadly impact communities and the communities will tell us particularly in the, in the most affected areas um, in response to the recent murders of Sam, uh, Olivia and Ashley um, the, the, the issues that most affect communities and a joint agency approach to tackling those in a meaningful way and the, the third aspect of it is the build, is, is where we, we can move on beyond that really, develop the sort of protect uh, and prepare elements of it, building social capital in communities, working and investing in communities to upskill so communities take ownership of some of that problem solving themselves. It's a really effective approach, it doesn't rely on policing being something that's done to communities, mm -hmm. but something that's been done for and with communities. Uh, and we've seen the results uh, in the beach of the world. Um, and we will see the results in these areas. So it'll be supported by some Home Office funding. We're going to support it with some of the existing funding we have uh, through our existing uh, programmes under Operation Interface. Uh, and we'll be supporting it with the um, seized criminal asset money uh, from community cash back uh, with some uh, participatory budgets in work in each of those communities. Mm -hmm. Those plans are being led by local police and being developed and reports on the Great, good. Good, okay, thank you for that. Um, any um, Okay, thank you. Well, as I say, I know there's been a huge amount of work that's gone into that, so um, it's useful to get that uh, update. Um, the other thing I was going to ask then in terms of emerging issues um, is around um, Operation London Bridge, which obviously has, has happened since we last met, um, and particularly that impact on resources. Uh, you know, obviously a huge amount of resources has gone into um, the investigation, the response to those murders, um, and what impact London Bridge has had on our on your ability to police this ad, albeit it's concluded now. So we did send over 160 officers to um, to Scotland and London as part of our mutual aid commitment for London Bridge. As you'll have read in the media, London Bridge has been in you know seven years in the planning, so we knew what the uh, the ask was, and it was broadly in line with that. There was some additionality uh, that was requested last weekend. I think we've been able to meet our mutual aid commitment and resource business as usual and resource uh, 
Operation Miller and resource our commitments locally for London Bridge. So the, the um, civic services that have taken place across, um, you know, a ten, the 10 day period across the city um, and indeed the other um, four local authority areas. So we've managed to resource all of that um, because our officers have demonstrated great flexibility in terms of council rest days, the extended total duties. Uh, that they've been, they've been working now for the past four weeks, so it's had an impact on our um, probably the, the well-being and the resilience of our staff, but it's not impacted on uh, our ability to keep the community safe and as you said, I think that's so. Great. Great, thank you. Okay, good to know. Right, um, so we move on now then um, to the uh, next bit on the agenda, which is around Peel. Um, so I think we've got uh, <coughs> slides to go, haven't we? Um, Louise, you take us through this, or do you no, want to take first? Yeah. You, unless, do you want to ask any yeah. questions around it, uh, Commissioner? No, well, if you want to go through the slides and then I'll jump I'll in. move it on while I'm okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, obviously, you, you're is. aware of uh, obviously the Peel assessment by uh, His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary mm -hmm. and Fire and Rescue Service, of which obviously the the previous Chief Constable of the Mersey side is now the lead and the cook. Mm -hmm. um, all forces are subject to appeal uh, assessments, which uh, relates to uh, policing uh, efficiency, effectiveness, and legitimacy. And there are 12 uh, pillars in relation to uh, to, to that. Um, our, our inspection, we were the first in relation to the new framework. Um, so our inspection has taken place over. At least two years now, if not uh, if not more, it's been subject to rigorous field work, uh, testing, uh, and obviously interviews uh, and assessments of staff, uh, reviewing of meetings, and, uh, and getting right under uh, the each of these twelve pillars to determine the judgment in each uh, in each uh, area. You see there in terms of our overall uh, of, our, of our ratings. Um, the, uh, the ratings range from outstanding, good, adequate, requires improvement and inadequate. Clearly, uh, we received one, uh, one adequate, um, and, uh, and I'll go into that in terms of a couple of areas that were identified for improvement, which are ongoing in relation to victims' yeah. needs assessments. Um, the, uh, there are two ungraded. Um, there are areas, particularly in relation to receiving police requirements and armed threats that aren't uh, um, graded, but clearly important. We are both. Um, Providing Merseyside, but also a national capability, obviously none more so than what's described over this last couple of, uh, of weeks uh, around this. Um, the um, outstanding, as you've heard, around a uh, serious organised uh, organised crime, something we're not complacent around the grading for that will change moving forward. Uh, we will still get force grading, we'll also be looking at our, our overall regional okay. approach and the approach of the Rocky. Uh, and again, Chris is linked in with, uh, with, uh, with Joe Edwards in relation to that. I think we subject to air inspection coming, uh, coming up. Um, yeah, early, early in 2023. Oh, the, uh, the timeline has just been pushed a little bit to the right, so early 2023 for the northwest uh, uh, region linked to all forces. And, uh, and on all uh, other areas, please, in the good, uh, the forces demonstrate substantially, substantially the characteristics of, uh, of, of, of good performance. Uh, there is no, no no lead table in relation to this. We yeah. want to, um, to, to 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 describe any other force because again that's a matter for the themselves. But we would say that the gradings puts us as one of the highest forces. Okay, that was one of my questions. How do we compare overall gradings around certain in top five uh, areas within the uh, within the, uh, the country? But not many that, have but... got outstanding for SOC. Many of the forces have outstanding for SOC. A couple of others. Mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Again, okay. good. But no forces have got every every force has been uh, the reports in front has been a graded and cut for victims. They, they've been graded as cut or 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 organised. Right. I don't know when it's got good or outstanding for victim service assessments. Are clearly nationally just worked for doing that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you want to go on the next uh, yeah. slide, I suppose I bring colleagues in. The, the report is online uh, yeah. around it for public accessibility. Yeah. Uh, around it, there is no link in there for our lead uh, inspector uh, Matt. Uh, Matt Parr, there are certain areas that, uh, that highlight particularly in relation to our process of organised crime, but then other areas, of course, is good at protecting vulnerable people uh, and preventing crime. There is a significant section in here around the forces approach to prevention. You, you're aware of, obviously, the, uh, the developments and the launch today around yeah. uh, um, our, our approach, as well as obviously having a strand to facilitate that and the work we're doing with partnership and the launch. 
uh, some more of a significant section here around, and we've already talked about stock and our, uh, you know, ultimately our efforts are to prevent it rather than just pursuing, uh, pursuing it. But the approach that John's led around problem solving being preventative is written very much within uh, within this report, was highlighted by uh, HMI PAR. Uh, there is a significant area around uh, first response uh, and uh, the expert support to officers that arrive first at, at an instance, particularly developments with call handlers, understanding why people are vulnerable and what we've done uh, around that. Uh, particular section on investigating crime uh, effectively. Um, which when you consider, and we were discussing yesterday, the significant increase in crime demand mm. uh, that the force is now dealing with, particularly over the last five years, the work that on the Chris Mark Camino to the lead for that has done in terms of reducing the time that it takes to investigate and bring the benefits to justice. You've heard about our outcome uh, rates uh, around that. Uh, again, we're really proud of, uh, of the work that's described there. Um, I think another area to highlight, John can expand on this, but you know the work is led around uh, community engagement and mm -hmm. particularly uh, particularly stop, stop search uh, around and there's a particular um, emphasis in terms of uh, the approach that we take in terms of uh, frontline development and support in terms of doing that uh, ethically and in terms of, uh, of doing it intelligence led but also the work that the John and Dad Parallel led in terms of scrutiny mm -hmm. that goes into that and reducing some of that disproportionality. So I think that is highlighted particularly here about John within the report. Um, the area around vulnerability is, uh, is, is highlighted most I've described as the chief uh, so it's, uh, you know, there is, we're proud of the work that's done there, we're not complacent, there's much that we still want to do, mm. particularly around our approach to reducing the impact on domestic violence and, uh, and, and, and rape. Um, but there are some significant areas to highlight to me, and I think an area of innovative practice that was highlighted around work that Louise and the team have done around the child exploitation risk index and relationship risk index, which is again, it's about seeking to identify and prevent rather than respond to obviously some of the tragedies that we that we get that we see. So that was an area of innovative practice that was highlighted in our report. And then behind all that of course is what's the plan that goes on. You know about the work that Jen has led in terms of our people services and significant developments and investment which we work through around our training process to invest in our people and the well-being mm -hmm. of, of our people. And we've seen that absolutely come to fruition over the last few weeks. Uh, around and of course the work uh, that's described there around group on financial management and the resource plan which we do obviously together with, with your team to make sure that again we are efficient in terms of our strategic uh, management of the here and now the next 12 months but also that four or five year uh, look, uh, look ahead um, unless colleagues want to pull out anything in particular there, there, there is lots of, uh, of yes. sort of areas of highlights in there some of which I've taken from not just my view, but from what the lead HMI says, and then we can go on to obviously the three areas of the uh, of, uh, Yes, and I have read the report and there is a lot, I think, most I'm pleased to be proud of, which is which is very welcome um, in terms of good work. But yes, obviously there's a couple of areas for improvement as well, so yeah, we can move on to these. So we can, we can categorise I suppose, the first two uh, together and then the, um, the, the, uh, the third one in relation to um, response to priority calls. So Paul, uh, Paul just in terms of the work we've done around priority calls, you're aware of the, we can start on the third one down there, you're aware of the review we've done around response and resolution and also the approach we are now taking, but do you want to just describe all the work we're doing in relation to that? Yes, absolutely. So, so the issue that uh, was highlighted about H H M I C F R S, which in effect we had already highlighted to them, in truth it wasn't something that they discovered. It's something that we yeah. offered up as a as a challenge for us. It's just how we manage priority calls. So you'll be aware that it, in effect we our current calls policy will like, in effect just grade emergency and priority. So we do pretty well in relation to emergency within ten minutes. Yeah. So currently we offer eighty six percent. And that invariably, a time, that's a year to date figure, and that invariably leads into the 90s. So, mm. satisfied we're in a good place with that. In terms of priority, that's pretty much for everything else that requires this, a, a, an officer to attend in, in, or go to. And that is attended within 60 minutes. So, the volume of calls that go into that probably sets us up to fail before we start because there's too many calls in there to get um, a, an officer to respond within 60 minutes. And we, and we know that, we recognise that. We schedule Domestic abuse, some of domestic abuse calls, and so we give them appointments so that there's a, an appropriate time. But the vast majority were not able to do that, and that's something we want to take forward in terms of the was was the R and R review mm -hmm. will now be subsumed into the C four review in terms of how we do that. Because what we believe is 
based on evidence, we can take 22% out of those priority calls and they can be scheduled. So that will be a scheduled time that's convenient for the victim. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can ensure that an officer attends at that particular time because what will happen now is obviously the calls will sit in dispatch and as more um, high risk calls come in, they have to be graded according they drop down the queue. That's yeah. not good for the victim, obviously. So there is some triage done in the control room to ensure it doesn't happen, but invariably with demand at peak times it does happen. So as we move forward with the C4 review, what we will intend is that we take a roughly 20, 20 to 25% of calls out of priority into schedule. We then have more officers available to deal with those emergency and those priority calls absolutely require an officer to attend within 60 minutes and then we can get a, give a better service to victims mm -hmm. and, uh, during a scheduled appointment time. And I think that's a good point because I think a lot of the feedback that I've had from anecdotally is, is when they get told somebody will be with you an hour and then two hours later they're still waiting. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they were just to say, actually, we'll come and see you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and we'll definitely turn up, that is often better. Um, and I suppose in terms of that communication where if they've been told someone's going to turn up in an hour, but then other mm -hmm. things come in and take priority, how do you then communicate back to the individual? You might be waiting for a phone call to say, actually, we're really sorry, we're not going to get to you today, but we'll definitely turn up tomorrow. Manage that communication bit as well, back to their kept informed yeah, around where things change. Yeah. Great. So the other two areas in relation to our um, support and services around uh, around bits, and I'll separate them off. So the first one was in relation to a, um, a need to consider I have services to vulnerable uh, victims. Um, again, maybe bring John in our use of the victims' needs uh, assessments is an established way that we use to uh, to consider uh, consider this. The field work uh, found that some of those assessments weren't always uh, recorded. Obviously, the force has been work around the victims' code, around the practical support, uh, and the discussion that we've got around the victims, the development of the victims' hold, separating off what is the requirements of the initial officers' assessments, and then obviously where the victims' hold as well as then that are more vulnerable. Uh, require more specialist uh, need or advocacy service. So, generally, is anything you want to raise in relation to that? Two key bits here. I think you know, all of these sit within the governance around the uh, victims' code and the developments of that as we move towards that being enshrined by the legislation uh, next year. Um, so, the victims' needs assessments, uh, as you're aware, linked to the assessment of vulnerability and how to keep victims safe during ongoing investigations. A uh, couple of bits of that. One is completing them, two, recognising the impact on the link to investigations, and then through doing something about it tangibly. Mm. Uh, and our approach to dealing with this uh, area for improvement is, is twofold or threefold, really. One is around the management information linked to the governance. So we've now developed a Delphi dashboard, which will show us, and it's as far as I'm aware, the first in the country actually gives us such a complete picture of how we're responding most effectively to all the rights uh, that victims have under the victims' code. Um, which then allows us to put effective governance in it and more importantly for our leaders to understand where, where they need to be in terms of yeah. impacting that and keeping victims safe, part of that weapon protection for victims. Uh, and then the other missing link to that really is uh, that, that additional support that we provide to victims, uh, which is very much going to be delivered through victim care, through the victims hub, uh, and identifying that risk um, where victims aren't satisfied or victims highlight areas that they are concerned about. We now have a more uh, joined up mechanism um, to link that to an op effective operational response via the, uh, the investigation and the crime itself. So those are kind of three elements, I think, developments and victims of um, the development of the management information and that link to governance on the important things for driving out our performance and that keeping victims in so. um, And what about, and I appreciate that we, we cover some of this at the um, Criminal Justice Board, um, that, particularly with that second one around uh, withdrawing some investigations and obviously um, a part of that is partly because things take a long time, you know, in terms of what work you do with our criminal justice partners. And um, as I say, I know we do some stuff at the board, but you have those relationships with partners to try and make sure that you get things through as quickly as possible so that victims are not left waiting. Yeah, so we do. So there's a lot of work, particularly, um, you know, it's, it's through the criminal justice board, a lot of that dependence on um, the CPS and uh, courts and tribunals yeah. service. Um, a lot of focus has been on the Crown Court, which was in um, reasonable shape compared to pre-COVID um, uh, performance like prior to the barrister strike, um, which is uh, taking place uh, currently. Um, but there is a significant backlog still in, uh, in magistrates' uh, courts in terms of the time it's taken. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have seen, regrettably, some cases um, being put back uh, due to industrial action uh, recently uh, and, and other reasons. So. Um, it is an ongoing impact. We work very closely with the court service 
uh, and the Grand Prosecution Service to ensure that um, A, we minimise the backlog, but from our own perspective, that we're delivering the highest quality um, evidence uh, and quality files to our yeah. partners in the CPS in the first place, so therefore uh, not causing any uh, further delays. Uh, and our witness care unit work incredibly difficult, uh, incredibly difficult, incredibly hard in, in a very difficult area to keep witnesses and victims engaged, but they have a significantly enhanced workload compared mm -hmm. to 2019. And it's about 30% 30, 30 higher than it was in terms of the number of victims and witnesses they are supporting. Mm -hmm. I suppose just to build a bit of on that, um, it, it's um, pleasing to see that myself and John uh, have regular meetings with the two Deputy Chief Crown Prosecutors yeah. and the join up between the, uh, the different parts of the process to identify those cases that are particularly vulnerable. Um, so, you know, all victims are vulnerable when they're victims of, of crime, but those particularly high risk cases where we have got delays, where all of the agencies are identifying and uh, actually looking to try and address it and see what we can do within the uh, yeah. And then like Matt and myself with uh, Jonathan's drawing in terms of yeah. that next you know, and, and really a sort of um us working to get to problem solve. Okay, great. So the second area that I've described yeah. with LinkedIn with that is, is you've heard about our approach around domestic abuse, the priorities taken, Chris has described the intrusion that we put around uh, around that. Uh, what was identified within the report was uh, that whilst there was a good approach to evidence by prosecutions, what we weren't always doing was recording the reason. Uh, to uh, to withdraw uh, okay. that support, so that is now uh, now in place. And yeah. to make around uh, around that. Yeah, and, we, and we've taken some practical steps uh, in terms of uh, the uh, the templated um, MG11s, so the statement forms. Uh, yeah. And we we've had today when we tested the uh, the performance across the course that we've got a number of those that are being dip sampled every single morning to make sure of compliance. Okay. Uh, when when that hasn't been complied with overnight, then immediate uh, action in terms of uh, notifying the officers, asking them why, again, in a learning environment to make yeah. sure that they don't repeat that same mistake. Um, and then conversely, celebrating the fact that uh, you know, some excellent examples of where it is recorded, where we followed an evidence-led prosecution, so where the victim has disengaged, but actually the surrounding evidence allows us to take forward to the Crown Prosecution Service. Mm -hmm. And again, we tested the different parts of the system. So it, as you know, it goes through the uh, police decision maker before it goes to the Crown Prosecution Service. So testing to make sure that the threshold levels are not set too high. And mm -hmm. actually we are putting cases through and, and uh, seeking the Crown Prosecution Service to make uh, decisions and then escalating. Uh, if we think we don't agree with that decision. And again, some really uh, good evidence. And I know that the chief reference she met with uh, Jonathan Stora uh, again very recently, and, and he is asking for more cases to go through, and we are making sure that we are pushing more cases good. through. Okay. Um, and certainly that showed up this afternoon in the, in the performance meeting that we. Yeah. Great, okay. Uh, so there's three, there's three other areas. So there's yeah. three, three areas we improved, three other areas mentioned. Um, John's already mentioned one, which was the, uh, so from the initial order then two improvements that we put in place around just identifying uh, those areas where, uh, of antisocial behaviour, where crime should have been recorded and significant improvements, some of which has translated into increases in, uh, in violence without uh, injury. Detective resilience, which has been taken off uh, from a, uh, improvement what is noting uh, the the plan that we have in place as a national issue mm -hmm. uh, around it and self Chris but obviously with the wider chief officer team just making sure that we look at and particularly with Dennis team around the capabilities and capacity of all our workforce but particularly private and our investigative capacity we've got a DHEP uh, program uh, now which I think starts in May 2022 is the first one uh, here, a development of an AIDS uh, program, career pathway, bonus payments, uh, flexibility on transfers, but there is a national issue right. uh, around that and clearly uh, it features in our C4, so our community first operating review uh, around that. But again, uh, HMIC, that virus is review was that they were happy with the plan okay. that we had in place, but we understood the gap and have had a plan, a clear plan to yeah. address that uh, with projections over the next few years. And then PTSO establishment, um, the force used data to understand the amount in its uh, communities, 
uh, put more constables into certain areas, such as the missing persons units, um, increase the size in one of its local policing teams, and just made a note around the fact that some of our uplift and constable recruitment and impacts on PCSO okay. numbers uh, as well, uh, but the force actually reducing uh, recruiting in that area and discuss that as you see the the other week. Right, so you are recruiting for more PCSOs to fill some of those gaps yes. that were less. Okay, great. And then just finally then on the appeal in terms of then monitoring this, the progress and making sure that you know you see the progress of the action so you can report back how is that all being done? Yeah, so uh, obviously the Chief Constable holds me ultimately to account for yeah. the delivery of, uh, of this. You know, our, 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 our um, CSD uh, officer Rachel Lee Smith does a tremendous job in terms of linking in with the, the new uh, uh, liaison and officer page my series he elaborates um, around it came to one of our meetings uh, yesterday and again provides that continuous uh, assessment rather than it being a, a one-off and then I build it into my bi-monthly performance meeting with the chief officers and the heads of strands and each of the chief officers in relation to the areas of action um, making sure that there's progress against the, uh, the uh, AFIs as well. Great. Good. Okay. Thank you um, for that um, overall good report with some good actions for improvement. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, so we were keen to talk about this because obviously we've received a, a, an increase in the number of officers now, which is really welcome. Um, so to try and get some detail in terms of where that puts us um, and where they've been going to. Um, if you could, are you, are you, are you this? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, this first slide shows. Uh, the allegation of 665, uh, which is our total allocation to the force of that number. Uh, the force was required to make a contribution to the number of shop here from three posts. Uh, that means that we have discretion over 642 uh, posts in total. Um, and then obviously the next few slides will then pick up and illustrate the areas uh, of uplift. Uh, as we've discussed. Um, and just for context then, so how many does that bring it to in total in terms of force, force establishment? Yeah. yeah. So as of the uh, the 30th of June, the full budget of FT was 4,196.8. The actual uh, head count was 4,066 of all of the budget of FT. Yes. Oh, for officers, or is it officers and that's yeah. officers? Yeah, police stops. Yeah, as officers, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. This uh, next slide here shows the uh, progress of where we are. So, what, for our death three year window, uh, the allocation of 665, and then that just illustrates the numbers across each financial year. So, 200 in 2020, 21. Uh, 199, 21 to 22, and a plan 266, uh, 22 to 23. Um, the force made a, dis uh, a decision very early on to upload, upload recruitment activity to get the numbers through. So we are at 12 months ahead of schedule, and then year three will be around that stabilisation of those large numbers that we are seeing uh, through that uplift growth. Great. So all six of the sixty-five are are in average training or all in process. Of course. Uh, if you come to the next slide, it gives you a bit of an overview here. So, uh, 2019, uh, you've got 328 new recruits, um, and then the deployments there around our and our policing and investigation, and then in 2020-21, 415 new recruits. Uh, some of those officers being posted to our non local policing, and then the remaining of those uh, deployed uh, against our operational needs. Uh, 2021 and 22, 340, they're all at different stages that, that initial training process uh, within the classroom or the academy environment, and again, will be deployed uh, in line with operational needs, and then the, the, the planned recruits. Uh, 160 uh, of those are on that dedicated detective development um, program, and at the point of substantive posting, will be put into investigation uh, and others against operational requirements. Um, so, where so where so where are they all set now? So, so they're all at different 
you know, they're all, the, they're all at different stages. I think you can see on the foot that, you know, 2019, uh, 2020, of, um, obviously, people there, two-year training cycle on there, and, and they're all posted. Right. Um, and then it explains where we've got in each year where they're posted to at the moment. Um, and I'm sure Jenny will come okay. in, but I think if you look at the numbers, that there's, you know, most of our police have recruited 1,400 new officers in four years. You cannot underestimate the impact that's had on the organisation from a recruitment from a training, from a chief constable, um, from a strategic workforce management perspective, mm -hmm. the team have demonstrated huge flex, you know, from a betting perspective, huge flexibility and have worked incredibly hard to make sure we're in that, you know, in, we're in the strong position uh, that, that we are in. And it's monitored virtually daily to make sure that we um, that we get there. Um, yeah. We have a very careful tracking process and we'll come on to attrition later on, but a very careful tracking process to make sure that the student journey right from um, the attraction plan right through the recruitment process into the academy, allocation of tutors and out the other side um, is very carefully planned. Um, I'm monitoring the numbers on all of the different courses and a good working relationship with LJ and you as well uh, in relation to those recruits because obviously that's part of the student journey and student experience as well. Yeah. So okay. um, very comfortable with the plan and where we're at against that plan as well. Okay. Um, and so obviously it looks like the majority from the first cohort are in response to resolution, which I guess is good in terms of getting more resources out to respond to 999. Um, how is that monitor in terms of obviously you've got a lot of young in service Offices now, what percentage that makes up, and how that impacts on there. So, um, I think it's fair to say, in relation to R and R, um, clearly uh, the uplift is, is to be welcomed for the yes. reasons that you've just said. It does provide that extra resilience in terms of those additional uh, student officers, and it does mean that we've got more ability to attend incidents, staff scenes, uh, constant ops, etc. Um, but I also think with that comes challenges. But they're good challenges, but they're challenges nonetheless. Um, clearly we need to tutor those additional officers, so those tutor officers then have to come out of their role, they're still part of those teams, but have to take time with those officers to develop and nurture the next generation, um, but obviously that then inhibits their ability to attend um, incidents at the same pace that they might have been able to because they obviously have to spend time tutoring and nurturing the next generation of police officers and then debriefing those incidents once they've been to them. And then there's obviously the progress reports that need to be produced as well. And obviously our professional development unit within the academy supports those tutor constables uh, in, in, in the good work that they do uh, across uh, response and resolution. Um, and then, of course, when the officers finish their tutoring phase, uh, they still have to carry on that learning. So that obviously then brings additional demand for their supervisors um, due to the volume of, of um, probationers that they have, sorry, student officers uh, that they have working uh, in uh, response and resolution. And then, of course, there's the extraction piece as well. So we have a carousel system to, to other strands, but then there's the mandatory CPD. Uh, back at the university, um, which you know, obviously can't be avoided, shouldn't be avoided, and is a positive thing because uh, they're an important part of the, the students' uh, learning. Um, but again, it's, it's positive because having the student officers coming through as they progress then allows the release of other experienced officers, for example, released to other strands. So it's good that we've got that capacity coming in, that are training up, that then enables that experience where, where um, we need it to, to move on. Um, in terms of the balance of officers in R&R &R, um, who are under three, three years, which mm -hmm. one of our, our programmes is three years, um, we, we've got a, a good balance, it's at 37%, so there is still a lot of experience within the R&R &R to bring that next generation of, of, of probation, of, so student officers uh, on. Um, and then just, you know, some more information just in relation to, uh, you know, complaints around new officers, we monitor that really carefully. But actually, um, when we've looked at that against younger officers, um, they're actually less likely to receive a complaint compared to officers who are um, longer in service. Um, so we look at that very, very closely because obviously that impacts on our training programme and look at the standards and values piece uh, with our student officers. So again, really comfortable about how we um, embed that at every stage of their journey so that they're yeah. the values of the Great, thanks. Okay, next one. Okay, so this is the uh, student officer leavers. Uh, for the purposes of this, we class student officers defined as anyone less than two years. Okay. Um, 
because we have to cut it off to, at, at, at that point. Uh, and not those that have transferred into the organisation, okay. so new officers. And then what we've done is we've removed any any zero months to yeah. just make it easier for you to see. Um, in the 16 months since April 21, uh, we've had an average of three to four student officers uh, leave every month with the exception of, of January. Uh, but when then you look in contrast of the preceding 24 months, only nine of those months had anyone leaving, and then right. it was around that one to two much. So again, uh, we do monitor those levers, and, and that's the biggest at the moment. So and I presume it looks like there's been a spike right? because we've been recruiting more. You know, on a short figure, you think we're, we're losing more officers in the last couple of years, but that's presumably we've recruited more in the first place. So yeah. that's why it's yeah okay. Yeah, um, and very small numbers to the back of the Yeah, and in terms of how it compares to other forces, is that roughly what the forces will see as well? So we will come on to that in, in okay. the slides, but we are, we are I'm very comfortable in terms of how we sit uh, with other forces in terms of that attrition rate, which we manage very, very carefully. Okay. But what I do want to say here is, you know, the role of supervisor staff is absolutely key around this. So yeah. the first time leader programme comes into this in terms of how we lead our people and, and value them. Um, and feeling valued is, is really key. Also, those opportunities for development as well, which we build into our student journey to keep people absolutely engaged in year one and year two. Um, but we know nationally and also it plays out here the impact um you know operation uplift you've already talked about in terms of the numbers you'll see a correlation there with the, with the pandemic when you look at the, 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 the chart there and we've also got the targeted attraction piece as well we're attracting people that perhaps may not have originally considered policing as a career um, and we've got a program in place with the academy which i'll come on to okay. make sure that we manage expectations so that we, we don't lose people later on that we're actually really open and honest around what policing is about yeah. so that we attract the right candidates in the first place and then of course you've got this you know, the generational differences as well around what people want out of a career and again that is all part um, of our workforce planning moving forwards okay yeah, great thanks Okay, and then this is the breakdown by ethnicity. So four out of the 72 student leaders disclosed their ethnicity as one non-white, uh, accounting for 5.6 of student leaders. Uh, from a forced level establishment perspective, non-white police officers account for 3.7% based upon uh, the last financial year. Um, when you then have a look at that across the regions, so the single force area, uh, we are below uh, the um, the average uh, and performing well against that group for the percentage of, of ethnic minority leaders. Okay. So without going into all the other forces, yeah, yeah. I guess uh, it, it is, uh, I would say, significantly okay. lower than those other forces. So we don't have any concerns around kind of non-white student officers coming in and leaving. So we, we, we monitor that very, very carefully, both through the inclusion board, which I chair, but yeah. also as part of daily governance, as you would expect. Yeah. Um, we have an interview process for all of our um, leaders from the organisation, which we've just tightened up for all of our our, our, our officers and staff. Um, but we manage it through click trackers, so we know how we compare with, with other forces. Okay. We know what we look like in terms of, of Merseyside, and we understand the issues. Uh, and for each of the cases, we, we um, make sure that we're tracking any trends and data, but also treat people um, on, a, on an individual basis yeah. as well to make sure that their experience is positive. Uh, okay. okay, so I'm going to move on. The next one, this one, is the top length of service of all student leavers uh, broken down by uh, reason for leaving. Um, just so you can try and quantify uh, resources of what's to be a and reason. So since April 21, personal reasons have been the main driver for those uh, people leaving. Uh, we had a slight spike in February of the total four uh, with two years of student officer training investment uh, in those officers. So uh, personal reasons uh, was the predominant reason. Um, also of note is December 21, uh, where we've got people uh, leaving due to wrong career choice. Um, and again, uh, we do look at uh, the level of training and length of service those people have got to right. so just consider uh, where the opportunities are. But yeah, so personal reasons and wrong career choice. 
are predominantly the two. So this is something nationally that policing is, is investing in through right. the police uplift team. Um, within Merseyside, we recognise that we want to understand the data even better than we do now. Yeah. Um, so we put measures in in Smart Force, so working with our people partners who work with the strong leads, uh, we get notification now both within the strand leads but also within the people partners where people are leaving us whether that be for retirement transfer to another force or just leaving um within their, their, mm -hmm. their, their initial period um so people partners are linked in very close to the strands and we are conducting interviews now as early as we can with people to really understand what those reasons are um, and um, our workforce planning team are, are working on how we better record that data so we can really drill down into, into those reasons. We've also got a program within the academy so that when the student officers are still uh, out on the strands, um, we've got a process in place if they're concerned about anything, they can go back and talk to staff within the academy and we can understand what, uh, what may be making them think about leaving and yeah. then we can address that early on before they actually make the decision. So we've got a number of measures in um, because we recognise that actually it costs a lot, you know, it's a lot of investment um, in year one and year two and year three of our student officers. So we yeah. want to make sure we maximise that investment and where people are right for us in, 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 in the career, then we absolutely support them to stay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This one is the number of student leaders and the length of service again. Uh, it shows uh, split by month and sex, uh, as well as total years of uh, service that we've got. Uh, male uh, leavers make up the 64% of the student leader by number, um, and then student officers less likely to leave, uh, but if they do, they leave earlier on in their service. So, Female officers, the female officers will tend to leave exactly. earlier in the service than the male officers. But about 64% you were saying were male leaders. Yeah. Does that reflect yeah. the recruitment in terms of are we recruiting about 64% of officers across the board? Like, we're not, not saying a disproportionate number of women and men leave. So when you look at the numbers going through the academy, yeah. um, we have slightly more female officers through the academy than okay. male, male um, and slightly more. So. The, the, the two data don't don't tally actually, so it's a right. positive. I think it's a positive picture in terms of our retention of the oh, yeah. okay, good. good. Okay. Okay. So there's a number of mechanisms in place to ensure student officers have both individual platforms to express the learning needs that they may have, uh, and that will help support officers through that journey through those key stages of the program that they have. Uh, through to full operational competence. So there's a number of uh, methods used there to identify and support learners. I don't know if you want to ask any questions on those. Do you want to just highlight Yes, yeah, so we've got uh, the initial assessment of needs, so that's the APP, AP11. Uh, lo obviously, lots of interaction with cost traders and assessors. Uh, assigned the tutor link of John Moores, which is, is uh, as Jenny suggested before, uh, focus groups are undertaken on a regular basis, as are module and course evaluations. Just council. So that's with the Liverpool John Moores John University, Moore, yeah. okay. uh, because obviously that is a big chunk of the student journey, so we work very closely with them to understand what does it look like within LJA and you, yeah. what does it look like here, and what can we do to support on both parts of, of that okay. pathway. And then we've got those um, those meetings in place between the student assessors and the lecturer. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of signposting and access to enforced welfare support groups. Uh, obviously, a huge wellbeing initiative uh, that we have yeah. ongoing, including us, Kilo staff associations, and our new development uh, around occupational health. Uh, the workplace tutor and the mentoring, as we as we we mentioned earlier. Um, the early interventions uh, from tutors and trainers to identify any of those uh, issues early on. Yeah. And then obviously that analysis of the exit questionnaires yeah. and interviews. Uh, and then with that, a student has a passport that follows them around so we don't lose any information. Um, so you're not getting any sense that any of the academic pressures are, are too much for anybody? Because again, you know, I know there was some anxiety from some attendees around us being a new approach of doing police recruitment, but um, we're not getting any sense on the academic side being 
So we will get individual officers clearly who struggle, and yeah. that's why we put the support in okay. uh, in those cases to make sure that where they've got an individual needs that they are picked up. But interestingly, we had a visit recently from the College of Policing, okay. um, who um, ran some focus groups with our students, um, who were very positive about the experience between ourselves and LJMU. Um, and I think it's it's a good relationship here, positive relationship, and we do pick up on issues early with our students where they might be struggling academically to look at what interventions we can put in place to support and help. Yeah, great. And because we've been doing the mock up passing out parades, um, you know, we've been having and, and yes, you know, so we've been able to have some contact yeah. with student officers. Yeah. Um, who you know, as Jenny says. Individually, might say it was hard, but I'm glad I'm doing it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So it's been a couple of conversations with students anxious about the latest assignment they've got to get done. But I think you know, I remember that as a student, and I was getting lost the degree. But yeah, no, it is broadly positive. So, yeah, just if we lose officers, if they decide not to stay, is there a cost then in terms of uh, John Moore's in terms of getting started that on that path, and then we obviously will take on it. Replacement. So if you look at the, the, the PCDA, um, that's paid for by the apprenticeship levy. Um, so once a student leaves the organisation, then payment to date for the student's apprenticeship obviously ceases at that point. Um, it's not a university uh, contract condition, um, but a condition written with the um, Education and Skills uh, Funding Agency Apprenticeship Funding Regulations. Um, and obviously the force and the university both, both comply with that. So in relation to monies received back from the university for the force as part of the delivery, um, an amount of 28% of the cost incurred for a leave today will be paid back to Merseyside Police. And then in relation to DHEP, uh, obviously that's directly funded by, by the force uh, with a cost per student. But if the student leaves before one month uh, from their start date, then no student fee is payable. Um, if it's one to three months, then it's 25% uh, of fees payable. And then if it's three to six months, uh, it's 50% payable. And after six months, it's 100% of the fee is payable. So we do monitor that? Yes. Yeah. That's true. Okay, good. Okay, so this um, next two slides show our comparisons of recruitment volumes pre and post 2022. Uh, figures consider the cost of the to do as to receive a conditional offer uh, because we do think that that's probably the best measure to uh, assess uh, the recruitment and any disproportionality within uh, within those campaigns. As the pre-employment checks and our you, you use different processes uh, that are largely out of the hands of recruitment itself. Right, so this is showing the outcomes of everybody who has been offered a no. Yes, Sorry. so almost like a different stage by ethnicity. Right. Um, because if it's also for group and talents, then like better. Yes, example, yeah, yeah. 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 So the historical data, uh, which is previously, is limited to the PCDA and the DCAP, uh, which replaced that above it programme in 2019. Uh, a total of seven campaigns, so four PCDA, two regular. D have a more career pathway. Um, there's 29 candidates that we've excluded. Uh, they're still live in it through the process. Um, and then so the current data, which is the one on the left, shows four campaigns. So two PCDA, one regular DHEC and one detective pathway. Um, and what you can see broadly across the proportion of minority ethnic applicants has increased. Uh, with the exception of black applicants, where the proportion is lowered by 0.01 percentage points. So, so this is applicants rather than successful recruitment. So at the top you've got 3.2% so 3 Asian, 0.6% black. That's the percentage of applicants. Yes, and okay. then we've you know we've almost tried to get them through that th those three stages of pre-interview and interview success. To be able to see right. any disproportionality within the process, uh, and we have to discount some that might come out through betting things that are outside of our recruitment, uh, right. yes, sort of ability to influence. So does that suggest then that the only it was only mixed and white who were ultimately successful? That the other ethnic we didn't recruit anybody from the last campaign around. I can't be right. 
So what you've got in the previous campaign, the proportion is two point so look at the Asian group, for example, two point six percent. And then in this pre this current campaign, it's at three point two percent. Of the applications who came from that FMI background. Yeah. But then in terms of the next bit down where you've got at interview success and pre-interview failed, are we then saying that of those applications, the only ones who were successful at interview stage were either from a white or a mixed race background? Um, at the time, because we've still got life, right. we've still got lots of you know, people within the pipeline, so we can only see what we can see so far with the campaigns. So how, where does this campaign get to? What, what's the cutoff for this snapshot here? Um, I only ask because I'm sure we've done attestations and there's definitely been yeah, black absolutely. officers and, and Asian officers, so I'm sure we're recruiting them, but that doesn't seem to be yeah, accurate. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have that data. Oh, okay, is it just the, the timing of it? We, we absolutely are recruiting, mm -hmm. um, just there are still 29 candidates still there not showing in, in the data uh, right. there. So in terms of each of the courses that come through, we, we track it right the way through in terms of how many people come into the pipeline, how long they take. We've got um, a huge piece of work going through the inclusion board at the moment looking at um, different groups, where they might fall out of the process, whether it might take longer for different um, groups to come through our, our recruitment okay. and vetting process. Um, so that piece of work at the moment is going through uh, the inclusion board, but, but that is showing that we are, in terms of the ethnicity breakdown, um, that we have um, increased in terms of um, some of our uh, minority and um, ethnic groups. So it's, a, yeah. it's a, a positive picture, but one that we absolutely need to keep monitoring to make sure that in terms of journey time through our recruitment process, that um, it is uh, we, we absolutely understand that journey for all yeah. our groups. So do you know what the, what the percentage is in terms of, uh, we did talk about it in a previous meeting around the percentage of new recruits who are from a BME background and how that compares? Yeah. So I think what we said last time was the organisation has grown by 2.5%. Mm. And I can't remember that was including officers and staff. But we know for people from minority ethnic background, the organisation's grown by 9.5%. Okay. So it, it is a, it is an improving positive picture, but as you can see, the, our challenge is still recruiting uh, uh, people that define themselves as black. Black, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's not the challenge on that. Okay. So presumably you're doing all the campaigns, I mean, we're going to come on to the race action, aren't we? But in terms of the learning from some of those campaigns and the engagement with the communities in terms of how we encourage more applications and, and pick up some of that. You know, and we will pick up the, the resources that the, the forces, forces put in and the investment that the resources, uh, the forces put in to make sure that we attract um, recruit through our pipeline and retain yes. um, people from diverse backgrounds. And we identify then at each stage if we're losing people at particular stage and not too far. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, and then the next one then, okay. And then this one is uh, protected characteristics, uh, current campaign compared to uh, past campaigns. Uh, what you can see from here is the, um, we have, um, Previously attracted more, uh, we are oh, sorry, we are presently attracting more females, fewer like, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and more people with disabilities than previous. Overall, that's that's what the data shows. So those last two columns, that's around disability, is it? Yeah. Yes, yes I remember yeah. those. Okay. Yeah. And obviously, a lot of this as well depends on people's disclosure of sure. information. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, okay. Okay, that's fine. Any other questions there? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, is that the last of that one? Yeah. Okay, so we move on now then to race action plan. Okay, Commissioner. Um, so you have you asked a number of questions in relation to uh, the race inclusion action plan. So I've focused some of the things I'm going to talk about in relation to that. But obviously, okay. if there's anything you want to ask it in further to that, then obviously. I can answer. So firstly, um, in relation to the progress made so far in terms of uh, implementing uh, the plan, um, an important aspect for policing in the early stages obviously was around driving engagement uh, in the consultation process so that we really did capture uh, what the public and policing thought of the plan. So we've invested a lot of resource into that to make sure that we've got a really good uh, understanding for our local context uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in Merseyside. 
Um, we're also working uh, on elements such as uh, reviewing and evaluating current products and initiatives that we, we already have ongoing um, in Merseyside, uh, creating those problem profiles and really understanding uh, where we've got any disparity or not, uh, both in internal processes or treatment of the public uh, in order to prioritise and really focus in on our activity. And we did share some of that data uh, at a previous stakeholder meeting uh, with, with key, key um, people, uh, and we will continue to do that in terms of transparency uh, around our data. Um, we've got four really clear priorities for delivery uh, by Christmas, one against each of the four uh, strands. Um, we've already talked about the work that's ongoing in relation to uh, stop and search, where we've reduced our disproportionality uh, and increased transparency through that publication of data and use of the scrutiny panels. Uh, and we are looking to develop that in further areas uh, listed under the Race Action Plan. Um, we are really focusing um, on black people being at the heart of our government. So we've got a number of things that we are doing uh, to really make sure that we land that in the right way in the organisation. Um, and we are scoping out anti-racism training providers. Um, so the Anthony Walker Foundation are providing training for uh, 15 officers tomorrow on a pilot. And I know that you've been briefed around this, Commissioner. Uh, that's at the Everyman Theatre, quite deliberately not on police premises with our communities. Uh, just scoping out how that would um, how that would be received by our officers with the, our community. Um, and um, our black communities are part of that, as is our uh, four network. Um, and that is all around um, anti-racism uh, and the language of anti-racism is the title of, of, of that, that, that pilot. Um, then in terms of um, who oversees the race action plan, the internal process and the reporting structure. So just a little bit about that. Um, clearly, I am the chief officer lead working into uh, the, the definite chief in relation to that. Um, the force has invested in a chief superintendent uh, as head of inclusion and we've also got a dedicated chief inspector uh, with some people working to him uh, to deliver uh, the race action plan with good oversight into each of the four areas nationally uh, as well uh, and that's given us really good engagement as well with our four network which is really important around how some of this lands. I chair the inclusion board quarterly um, to make sure that the force delivers against the race action plan um, and of course we deliver the NPCC diversity quality and inclusion strategy so that oversees that um, and that includes representatives from right across the force uh, as well as our support sorry our staff support networks um, and the the MIAG representation as well for scrutiny uh, as well um, we've got work stream leads aligned to each of the four um, uh, strands of the plan at a senior level um, and we operate on a three monthly basis. So the first one, um, our chief superintendent meets individually with each strand lead and any of the enabling services to make sure it's delivery. Mm -hmm. The second month, um, we meet uh, across all of the four so that the independencies are picked up. And then the third month, it comes in to meet for scrutiny uh, at the inclusion board and support to make sure that we are on track uh, with the delivery. So in terms of um, early indications of the, the results of the community consultation uh, around the plan that, that took place, um, obviously there was national, extensive national consultation that will help us shape the plan moving forward and we expect the outcome of that in, in early 2023 20, uh, and that's the first iteration I think of the, the, the national uh, plan and obviously any changes we will make sure uh, are formulated in, in, in the investment that we are uh, putting into this work. Um, and then in terms of feedback, uh, we, uh, through partners and community groups around the plan, that is ongoing. We welcome that feedback and challenge uh, around our approach. Uh, we have the next stakeholder meeting on the 7th of October in the uh, Kumamani Centre, um, and we are making sure that the engagement is, a, is away from these premises and, and with communities. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that engagement has been fed back into the national team, um, but I, I recognise that communities will judge us uh, quite rightly around what looks different, what feels different, um, and, we, and the results of this work, which we uh, absolutely are committed to delivering and committed to uh, communicating and um, two-way communication with our communities around the results. Great. 
Um, so uh, I should say we had um, a couple of public questions around um, around this, um, and I think you've already touched on it. So you might not have more to add, but I'll ask them so, so people can we've asked them. Um, so what is the organisation proactively doing to ensure that staff are suitably trained in all diversity matters? Um, and I suppose this, this, the, the key bit of that is how are you going to measure um, the success of that? And then the second question is around what training will be provided to officers who are sanctioned for breaching diversity codes of conduct. Um, and how is that development monitored? So specifically in a, in a, a conduct setting, what work have you got going on around that with member of the public? Um, so firstly, if I just pick up in terms of the training, so I've already talked about the pilot that we've got running uh, around that we spoke anti-racism training in Merseyside mm -hmm. with Merseyside communities, because that's really important that it's about uh, our context and our communities here. Um, we're also engaging in the Inclusive Employers Scheme, which provides additional learning platforms for, for our staff. We have already delivered a number of listening and action sessions um, where we've done professional discussion uh, around diversity and inclusion. And it's also integral to, integral to our first line leaders programme as well, mm -hmm. which in itself is, is driving a cultural programme um, of, of um, change across the organisation, which is monitored through uh, my leadership board, which I chair. Um, we are also uh, undertaking a cultural audit, which will help us assess the thoughts, feelings, behaviours and, and, and knowledge um, of our, our staff. And that will be our baseline uh, from which we will know um, how we make a difference through this investment. The other bit is, um, as part of the inclusion board, but also the leadership board, there is a suite of measures um, that we have uh, where we can actually test whether or not uh, there is a shift um, in behaviours uh, against some of the things that we are delivering in, in the, the, the race action plan. Um, so it, it, while some of this is, is slow burn, um, there is some really hard data there that we can test whether or not the dial is moving in the right direction. And there's some really good indicators there and some good work already uh, that, that forms part of that board. Um, and then in terms of training uh, for officers who are sanctioned uh, for breaching diversity codes of conduct, uh, and how we uh, develop, uh, so how we monitor, how we, that development is monitor, monitored. Uh, we do offer additional um, support and training to officers, as you would expect, who are sanctioned for breach of conduct, along with the appropriate supervisory support. Um, and we're currently undertaking a review of training in, in regards uh, to that, uh, in accordance with obviously the Chief's uh, priorities around inclusion and preventative uh, programmes of work. So um, our aim is clearly to have behaviours that are appropriate to our um, just principles and the code of ethics yeah. um, and uh, the work that Jenny has led on the leadership board across to the work that Chris, for example, is leading around Borg, uh, our leadership uh, approach, uh, but also flows through, we talked about training, through our training from the moment and some of the awesome field organisation in these race activists, the Chief Constable will be speaking to new recruits around the ethics and standards, and that flows through every bit of the training and continues in through uh, in, in this part of continuous professional development. Um, obviously, with uh, the work we do around um, standards and the appropriate authority, mm -hmm. uh, we take a, uh, a rigorous approach to people who breach um, the standards uh, around, uh, around diversity. Um, uh, and indeed, whilst following through the process through to um, to appropriate panels, clearly um, where there are breaches um, in relation to particularly in relation to um, protected characteristics, uh, this will often lead to sanctions that are in line with gross misconduct. Clearly, that is not to circumvent the panel, and we have obviously public uh, convened hearings mm -hmm. with legally qualified chairs uh, as well before we take. Uh, breaches um, in this area, particularly serious, and each one is assessed on its own merits, but against the, the against the standards yeah. that the chief constable sets within our organisation, that we all expect as a leadership team to be applied. Well, that doesn't mean to say in some areas where there is learning, because diversity covers a whole area of breach in terms of those standards. Uh, but we take a very rigorous approach where uh, those codes are breached. Uh, around, around and you are aware obviously of where we put people recently yeah. two panels and quite rightly people have been dismissed from our organisation clearly we seek to prevent that by the manner in which we recruit and we've talked about the way we're recruiting and seeking to recruit difference into our organisation and therefore then the standards that we continue to reiterate at every opportunity whether that is formal but particularly through the leadership that we expect in our organisation at every level. Okay. 
Um, thank you for that. Um, in terms of then the, the broader race action plan, so I suppose the Mersey side one, what are the timescales for that and when do you anticipate that being published and I suppose how much of that will be accessible for the public and around data and things? So um, obviously it's the national plan and we are then benchmarking ourselves against the national plan so right. each strand <coughs> pulled out each of the parts of the action plan allocated over the time scales to that. Okay. So we will be open and transparent through our stakeholder meetings and then also through the communications that follow from those meetings in terms of the publication of data um, etc around that. So. Um, but, but in terms of how that plan will change on the back of the, the consultation, in terms of the national consultation, yeah. we will get the results of that um, 2023, early 2023, and that may then change the national plan in terms of how we, we respond to some of that. But, but we are working against the, the, the format that's already in place at the moment, but recognising there might be some changes nationally, and also recognising that some of the work is also um, being progressed nationally as well, but we're not waiting for the national. Yeah. We are progressing it anyway, and then we will take on board whatever the national has got to say, but we're not waiting. Yeah, because I was going to say also 2023 is like, it's a long time away um, for them to pull together community feedback. So it's just risk of these things drifting. So I think as much as we can do locally to get ahead of it, you know. Would be... yeah, so we've adopted the national plan. Yeah. But, uh, you know, um, they are going out and doing the extra, you know, more, more consultation. Yeah. So as Jenny says, we are working through all of the actions under, under, the, under the four pillars already. Okay. And we have a comms plan in place. So each month now we will be doing some releases in relation to work ongoing in relation to the inclusion program, program of work of which the okay. action plan is a part. Good. The, the, the area that Jane leads on reports into the Chief Council on a bi monthly basis in terms of the rigour in which those pillars are tested, yeah. in terms of the quality assessment as well as the quantity of data. Uh, we've talked about in terms of what, so what does that difference mean? We've really drilled down and saying what do we want to look different over the next few months. The, the other bit of, while well, we've had um, excellent community feedback in terms of the listening sets on, they are continuing as well, I have to say. Um, the work of our core network, mm -hmm. which the BPA provide, and if we are all members of, of our community yeah. as well as being serving police officers and staff provide both support and appropriate scrutiny to us in, in terms of areas that we feel that, that are helping us move forward but also scrutinise the actions and our leadership in terms of taking, taking some of those areas that Jenny has described forward uh, as well as provide immense uh, value. Uh, Jenny, you're going down to the uh, conference, the, uh, the National Police Association conference uh, as well. So there's real rigour and acceleration, but we know there is, as described by Jenny, areas that we really want to take forward, but hopefully that outlines the progress that we are making. And you've already heard before about the real differences making, some of which was described in the HMIC FRS report, for example, around community engagement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, thank you for that. Um, right, uh, we move on now then to finance. Thank you, Commissioner. Overall, uh, year to date, at the end of uh, quarter one, we were £2.7 million underspent against budgets on, on, on the main budgets and also £2.5 million underspent on the uplift budget. In respect of the, uh, the normal budget, the £2.7 million, we're already seeing that sort of levelling off, uh, as you probably expect, with the unprecedented cost pressures we're seeing within the force, uh, including uh, about £1.3 million. Three million pound more for utilities, and um, about half a million pound more we expect for fuel alone this year. So that's mm -hmm. starting to really into things along with all the other um, cost increase that we've seen in for things like tyres, um, uniform, other types of equipment. So it's having a real impact. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, we're in a reasonable position this year to sort of cope with this. But if it continues on uh, at the rate and it grows at the rate it is, that will be uh, an issue. So uh, it's, it's one we're really uh, watching uh, and monitoring. Okay. On top of that uplift budget, um, the reason why you know we've been really prudent the way we've allocated uplift budget, but we're going to go through the process the next month or so of, of starting to allocate a bit more out. Okay. We've done it very much in a bidding process rather than just give everyone the budget. And also the fact is uh, when we were funded, we were funded for things like overtime and areas like that. And because the new, we haven't eaten into that budget, but we know we, know we will do over time. So we're in a sort of a one-off benefit at the moment with that, but knowing that that will get eaten away over time. Mm -hmm. um, and as officers go up their scale, 
um, we'll see right. that eroded down. So, uh, because we are being so prudent, we're in a, we're in a reasonable position, um, but not one we can't waste. Okay. So when it says um, uplift, underspend, yeah, is that is that offices or is that the additional money it's, that you get? The, the, it's pay? it's yeah, it's it's the um, the offices and the non-pay, the right. uh, the non-staff <laughs> cost we've got. Uh, we were given, but we've already got a number of pressures uh, that we now need to fund. We're just going through a rigorous process before we just okay. give the money out. Chief officers will be fully aware of how we're going to do that and, okay. and the approach with that. And John will be, uh, you know, be brought into that process as well. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the broader issue, then I'll underspend, but so what's that? Yeah, so not, I mean, the organisation utilises overtime, uh, you know, not surprisingly, really, given all the pressures, whilst we continue to recruit so, uh, a lot of the offices we have during that probation period, we, we can't use for some of the complex operations. Um, so typically, we, we've only got the same offices, but, you know, we can't just bring people in to do that. So right. we have to use our own offices that are experienced. So a lot of these overtime areas, so that's why that's still showing you know, um, as a cost against the understand on the staff, and that's largely the reason for that. So once the posts start to get filled, we should see that underspend go down and the overtime reduce as well, because we'll be using... I'm not saying the overtime's going to reduce because of the number of operations, you know, um, what we would hope to see some sort of reduction in overtime, but because of the type of um, funding we've got from the government, it's not recurrent, is it? Right. But other than this reduction, that partnership work, it's, right. although we've got some certainty because we know we're going to get another two years, it's still a, a gamble to then go out and recruit permanently for those yeah. posts. Okay. So if, if we knew it was in the baseline, that would make it so much more, yeah. although there would still be that time log is recruited yeah. three years through. Yeah. Then, uh, and then say typically you want your more experienced officers doing some of the complex work. Yeah. Um, these operations okay. require. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, capital. We've, um, you know, we've a lot of capital spend. You tend to see quarter one being quiet, and then it ramps up. Yeah. Uh, this is this is no different to that. We still continue to face issues, particularly on vehicle. Um, supply, as, as, as I think you're aware, mm -hmm. uh, but we're working closely with Blue Light, um, the um, you know the commercial um, organisation that supports us to try and get as many vehicles through as possible. But it yeah. is it continues to be a challenge. <coughs> and the safe the uh, St Anne Street, so the delays there meant that the, uh, the spend goes into this year. Yeah. So we we expect to get all that completed um, and and spent for the St Anne Street, which is twenty odd million. So. Um, we're confident we'll spend on that. If not, we'll you know we carry forward um, in, into the into the following years. We know we you know we need to spend it subject to the ten year state yeah. strategy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the last one is just really for, for note. Um, we're in a good position regarding the balance sheet. What we've done um, in the last month, working with John. Is to uh, is to make sure we um, we've been really we've really benefited from short term deposits, mm -hmm. um, on, on, you know, and, and investments and um, and also short term loans in particular. We've uh, we've benefited from the lower interest rates compared to long term loans. What we're seeing now is because of the change in interest rates, yeah. we've now moved. Um, you know, we've now gone to move into borrowing about 40 odd million into long term investments and, and we'll reduce the short term, sorry, borrowing and we'll reduce the short term borrowing by that amount. Yeah. So we're not borrowing more, if you know what I mean. But what we're doing is switching from short term to more long term. Yeah. Um, just while we see how the, you know, what happens with interest rates, we don't want to do and fully flip into the long term um, if interest rates then come down next year. So we're just playing a bit of a middle um, position on it. Okay. I'm presuming that would be similar for other forces, all doing the same thing. Uh, it's, it's difficult to know, really. It's not something that particularly is shared. No, right, um, right. Very much sharing really... budgets, sort of, in for any savings, yeah. but not particularly what we do with balance sheets. But um, I, I, I think we've, we're, we're doing a prudent thing. We're still yeah. benefiting from short term. Okay. As soon as that changes, we will then move into the long term okay. um, money and, and secure that. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any budget now? Mm -hmm. So have a meeting planned in next week with John Sue yes. uh, to discuss obviously the current position in that uh, yes. to keep articulated yeah. um, okay. and our approach to positive efficiency for the NTFS as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
well. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Right. Um, thank you, Keith. Uh, if we move on now to the specified information order, so um, again, this is a standing item um, of nationally measure, national measures um, that we go through. So, um, I mean, do you want to just run through them and then we'll, we'll probably a couple of last questions on the book because we look at them every time. So, okay. Uh, so, it looks like they just gives an overview of what those uh, the national plan of recent outcome measures are. Uh, some do have uh, data, some are police-led data, some NHS data, and crime survey in London and Wales. For the purposes of this uh, presentation, we've picked the closest metric to indicating our performance against those because mm -hmm. uh, not all of those indicators are available to us. Okay. 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 So the, the next one, this is the first outcome is the forces to reduce murder and other homicide uh, and um, what they uh, they would originally uh, they, the sorry the national um, measure is police recorded homicide in this indicator so this shows the uh, trend over the last five years for non-domestic related homicides uh, and a, a, a sporadic trend for domestic related homicides uh, we've also, just for uh, the purposes of interest, included whether that homicide had uh, was firearm or knife enabled. And we can see also that it has spread over the last eight years mm. uh, with some of those decreases in the most recent year. And then on the right hand side, we also monitored uh, as part of our operation interface critical success factors. And under 25 and they've been able to contact victims. So slightly different operation but relevant to this indicator within the national measures. Um, and you can see um, uh, the numbers there. So 21, 22, uh, there's two there. At uh, most that we've had was, in, was three in 2017 into 18. Mm. So that's under 25 involving knives. Okay. okay. Next slide, this shows the, um, the indicator is to reduce serious violence and the national measure is police reported crime and the take data that we have access to. Uh, we are seeing other indicators, other data coming online from the national digital um, path that we're starting mm. to get in, uh, but for uh, the purposes of this meeting, that's not a published data yet, so for the purposes of this meeting, we'll continue to take data. On the left hand side, you can see under 25 knife crime victims attended versus admitted to hospital. Uh, it includes data up till June 22, and when you compare to the same on um, 12 months. Uh, for same period, 12 month period for 2021, we can see an 84% reduction from down from 45 to 7 in those under 25 victims being admitted to hospital for a sharp object assault. And then, just, just, a, just, you know, that is such a significant reduction, you expect us to be challenging that, but digging into that to understand that uh, a bit better with drawing into your intelligence group. Um, the numbers are so low, mm. small question mark about it. But when we do look at the, the government data, the data that the government uses, I know we're going to introduce it here, but that is showing in itself, government data is showing a more than 33% reduction in okay. uh, admissions. So the numbers are to be determined in terms of exact, the exact levels of reduction. But what we can say, I think, with some certainty is there's a very significant Reduction in the number of under 25 being admitted to hospital as, as a result of a uh, sharp incident injury, which okay. translates over to some of the other data that the boys will come on to now. Very much, I would argue, uh, linked because the sustained fall and the sustained improvement in safety overall uh, linked to, to our operational approach to re reducing crime, but also as well to that preventative approach that we've done with our partners. So in terms of that, the so the one on the right, <coughs> so the under 25 is a bit going down, 
Am I right in saying that the over, the over 25 has been going up? If you compare yeah. the, that period, April to June, but if you remember April, April uh, May in 2021, there were still some government restrictions in place, so I think right. it would be better comparing uh, a broader time span. If we compare April to August, uh, of this year and April to August of last year was shown in a nearly 5% reduction in over 20 lives the victim of uh, knife-related injuries. Nice. So when we start comparing apples with apples really, we're starting to see those reductions coming out and interestingly this is the, the, the summer violence period so the rest of the many areas in the rest of the country saw a significant increase in serious violent crime over the summer last year with prompted governments mm. uh, to lean in and demand uh, we all submit and develop plans, um, which we did, uh, and again, we, we have seen a reduction in violent crime uh, rather than uh, a peak, which other places uh, will see. Our key area generally is September, October, November uh, for increases in violent crime, and we have plans in place to get that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, this one here, the take home from this, the graph speaks for itself, really. On yeah, the of and we've talked about it a lot there already. Yeah, so 55% reduction to this 2019 and 20, and this one is around the next slide, sorry. Uh, we move on to neighbourhood crime. So, uh, this is starts with burglary residential, uh, reduction of 5.5, so 65 less uh, for the financial year. Um, it's compared to the same period last year, and again, a real a downward trend. We are seeing continued down, downward trends in regularly residential, which we know this is only up to a certain period, but that's continued for the, the summer months. Good. Do you know why? Is it just good police work? <laughs> It's a combined effort, it's a combined effort across a number of things. Um, and, and I know we've provided uh, some detailed bullet points there, and I won't go through them all because there's about 30 or 40 things. But um, think back to the uh, ACC's performance meeting now yesterday, it's about the strong plans that are in place, yeah. consistently delivered across the force with partners. So making sure that those 4P plans, they have got all the latest evidence-based policing innovations, yeah. uh, examples in whether you're pursuing offenders and managing offenders or whether you're doing the preventative work. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, they are strong plans that we've got in place and they are being delivered strongly. Now we are, we did see today, we concentrate on one area where we see, well, okay, so, so some of that reduction is shallowed out and we've seen some increases in, uh, in a certain area and that's where we go into the plan and say, right, well, are we, are we delivering the plan to the level? Where do we need to strengthen across the force yeah. with all the strands working together and the external partners? Yeah. I'll just pick on one example of, uh, of something that's been picked up nationally and we've led on as a force and then uh, some innovative stuff which out into the community that has a real impact. So um, the staff have developed a QR code that we've released out into the community for members of the public to uh, send through directly in mm -hmm. into our, our uh, nice link. Any suspects um, ring doorbell footage or CCTV that they have. Mm -hmm. So we've had a number of members uh, who have sent footage in of suspicious circumstances, someone going up and down driveways at you know two o'clock in the morning. No no offence has been committed um, on first sort of blush of, of, of the uh, information. But then the wider information that we can glean of who that is and what they've been up to and linked to other offences. So that intelligence mm. in, the, in the form of that video or CCTV on the doorbell um, has, has been great in terms of being able then to target our controls to where they need to be targeted. Good. Good. Good stuff. Thanks, Okay, this is the picture for robbery. Uh, an increase of 13 crimes for the same period in 21, 22. Uh, it is uh, on an upward trend, you know, when you look at the, the, the graph, but it is noticeably lower uh, than the same period in 2021, the southern period, uh, with the financial year to date, monthly average of 106 offences being lower than the uh, previous year, uh, which was at 109. Okay. The next slide is uh, vehicle crime again. Uh, we are seeing increases in that theft of 
uh, that from this vehicle is mm -hmm. predominant. Uh, this is obviously an overarching category, it's got a lot of different types of vehicles going within it. Um, uh, we have an average of 602, slightly higher than that, a uh, monthly average of 593 over last financial year. And then the next one here, that person, uh, we have seen a, 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 an increase of 89% in the volume when you look at 21, 22, um, the monthly average obviously being higher. I would caveat this with them, there is some data quality issues with this, okay. which through checking uh, the processes that we've got in place, we do think we've got some incorrect crime, or we've, we've reviewed like 900 cases and there's quite a lot of incorrect crime categories within there. Okay. So we've done a lot of work around that with our false crime registrar. So there is a health warning on the volumes. Okay, all right. So you can maybe really look at that the next time and see what it changes. Yeah. Okay. The next one, drug possession. So this is a national measure around drug crime using police causes data drug possession uh, and trafficking, uh, an increase of 4.8 when you look at the monthly average this year compared to last 73 against 63. Um, and again, this is heavily linked to our proactivity uh, work. Okay. Last uh, on this one is the satisfaction amongst victims of domestic abuse. Uh, what you can see in two important periods that we've tracked here, uh, 20, June 21 up till May 22, against June 20 to May 21, uh, you can see um, uh, significant increases in uh, some of those categories. So ease of contact, percentage of victims happy with that, domestic abuse victims 93%. Action taken 71 from 67. Follow up again, always a uh, challenging group category. Uh, we're seeing increases from 60 to 62%. Overall treatment uh, up by one percentage point at 92. Uh, and whole experience 89. That whole experience isn't a cumulative total of those others, it is on the whole. How it found, found it, you know, how you found it, and that's, that's the question on that. And what we can see is we track uh, those who are outcome 16, uh, so people who don't want to continue yeah. with, a, with a, uh, an investigation, and we do generally see higher um, satisfaction rates against all the other outcomes. Okay. Oh, and then stop search. And then this is the stop search figures. So, um, stop searches in the most recent 47,190. Of those, we have a positive outcome rate of 23%, 8% uh, of rest, 77% uh, of the new further action. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, thank you very much for that. And as I say, we'll kind of dip into the different ones of those each uh, individual, depending on um, time. Um, right, the last bit there now is public questions. So we obviously um, invite your questions from the public to put us the chief and the team. Um, so and I will say I'm positive times. We might not get through all of them, um, but we'll certainly go through what we've got um, and um, see where we get to. So first question we've got is around um, how much money, this is a very technical question, so apologies you uh, How much money was returned to most likely from the Home Office by the Harris scheme last year? How was this cash invested in the community and police force? Do you have a breakdown available? Somebody knows this about Yeah, so last year we um, the, the income was 1.8 million. Okay. The um, cost for running that, that team um, with the force, you know, officers and staff, it's 1.3 million a year. So there's a, a net benefit of 600,000. That's not being put out because it's only just been, you know, the year's not just closed that long. So that'll be part of the um, process now for um, community based crime reduction initiatives. I need the community cash back, so uh, that part be part of the fund given for that. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, next question is, I want to join the police but have no formal qualifications. Why can't I learn the job whilst working with the police? Okay, so nationally you need level 3 qualification, which is equivalent to maths and English at A-level. 
in this course, we've made the right decision uh, for our context um, and our um, geography uh, that you would only need a level two qualification. So we are very one of the very few, if only the only force in the country doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and that shows that, that it's the right thing to do in terms of our recruitment and diversification in terms of the job from which we recruit. But to try and get yourself through the apprenticeship at the same time as not having a level two qualification, we made a decision early on that that would be too big an ask. Right. Uh, and hence why that's happened. But I do think we need to remember the history to some of this. When I joined the police in 93, I had to do a maths and an English test, so there was some level of competence there that we've always had to have in, in policing. Uh, but because it is formal, actually the level two, I think, is, is the right level uh, and right for, for Merseyside and our communities. Okay, great, thank you. Um, do the police deal with endorsable fixed penalty notices with points on driving licences for dangerous parking in double white lines in the world? Wording on that one. Well, the answer would be yes, but then just caveat it in certain circumstances. So we would deal with the offence of dangerous parking. Uh, Rule 240 of the Highway Code prohibits stopping the parking of a vehicle uh, under specified circumstances. That includes double white lines. Um, and that rule is there to ultimately promote public safety uh, because, of course, if you were to park in those, well, those, those lines are to identify hazard. If you were to park in that situation, then it might cause a vehicle to have to straddle white dogs, put constant white lines to, to pass it, likewise, get too close to people passing the vehicle. So, again, under those circumstances, Section 22 of the Road Traffic Act, I believe in a dangerous position could be used in those circumstances, and that would be uh, dealt with by the issue of a traffic offence report, which is three penalty points and £100 fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, obviously, another question um, linked to that parking is around, um, and it's a, uh, yeah, dangerous parking is around uh, pavements and bends in residential areas. This is obviously an issue that comes up a lot for us. I know the Chief have other questions about as well in terms of our response to parking. Yeah, so I suppose to follow on from the previous answer, so the police, most of the police will proactively enforce parking offences such as unnecessary obstruction and willful obstruction, but most parking offences with Mesa were decriminalised and it was a responsibility passed to local authorities to enforce. Parking on the pavement is not illegal outside of London, but you can still get a fine if you do it in certain, in certain circumstances. Yeah, Again, in London to park on the pavement? Yeah, sure. oh, no. Yeah. So the Highway Code, we're well back to the Highway Code, says Rule 242, you must not leave your vehicle or trailer in a dangerous position where it causes unnecessary obstruction of the road. So if a vehicle is reported or seen by a police officer and judged to be dangerous or causing unnecessary obstruction, then yes, it can be dealt with by a fixed penalty notice. And just, I guess, following up, that is absolutely an issue that we uh, that is considered within the Road Safety Partnership. We work closely with local authority. And then community groups and communities where we look at the hotspots and we try to uh, reduce instances of dangerous parking, the implications that has. So certain measures such as parking posters with a mock parking ticket can be left on vehicles and that's attached uh, with local pedestrian Q&A guidance. There's a fourth dedicated email address for people, members of the public are encouraged to email in photographs of vehicles parked in those certain circumstances. To date, we've had 573 uh, park, pavement parking submissions. 292 of those resulted in the letter being sent to the register keeper around that uh, inconsiderate uh, parking. Uh, and year to date, we've issued 1,000 fixed penalty notices for unnecessary or willful obstruction. Good, thank you. Uh, right, I'm conscious of time, so I'll just ask this um, last one and then we'll get some rich responses out to the rest. Um, and so this was, we had a lot of questions submitted around um, activity in New Ferry, Bromborough and West Kirby and particular concerns around unsocial behaviour and the perceived lack of visible police presence in New Ferry and Bromborough um, and again ASB um, in West Kirby. And I think we have discussed this before as well in, when we discussed it a, a few months ago around unsocial behaviour. So clearly there's lots of concerns there um, in terms of what the force is doing. Um, are we doing enough? Um, what were you? Well, some residents don't think so, um, based on the questions, but there's a very uh, dedicated policing team and we're led by Matt Mosscroft. The, uh, we've invested in the Park Wildlife Resources and bolstering neighbourhood resources there and they have some very um, effective plans in place to deal with predicted increases in antisocial behaviour. So if you look at the planning um, at the conclusion of uh, pupils' exams, the increase in summer antisocial behaviour in West Kirby linked to beaches, the use of Section 34 dispersal orders where appropriate has reduced the incidence of antisocial behaviour across the summer. 
uh, and the policing team are working closely with the local authority around the PSPO uh, for those areas. Um, again, then we look at um, Bromber and New Ferry. There has been an increase in uh, young people, particularly uh, lighting fires, uh, antisocial behaviour, and some sort of low level disorder. Um, the team very tuned to that. Again, we've used two Section 34 disposal uh, areas over the last uh, quarter. Um, where appropriate to reduce that, and there's a clear focus, it's a clear local priority across the world in reducing antisocial behaviour. The teams themselves, the two neighbourhood teams, have um, regular publicised surgeries and forums to work with the public. Uh, they work with residents groups, so to meet us Mondays and walk about Wednesdays in the respective uh, neighbourhood area, neighborhood areas. Uh, they're focused on it, they know the challenge, they want to do their very best for local communities. So if there's something that communities want to see done differently. Mm -hmm. um, I would strongly urge people to get in touch with the neighbourhood inspector, so Pete Brexwinkle uh, and Alan McEwen, um, exceptional individuals, uh, passionate, committed to doing their very best for communities. Um, so if people want to see us do something different, please engage with the neighbourhood teams yeah. um, and they will be responsive to that. But the, the surgeries on Mondays and Wednesdays are publicised. Uh, people are very welcome to attend uh, and highlight areas of concern and we will respond to that. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, all right, thank you all very much for that. Um, that was a lot of two hours, but I'm grateful for your time and your rearranged um, schedule. Um, the next meeting is going to be on the 20th of December. So I'll see you then. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.